Okay, we are back for part two of the Q&A, which has yet again gone ridiculously long, so... On with the show! George Paramore. Why the jump in designations to the M103 from all the earlier numbers? Good question. As ever, the US system seems to utterly defy rational basis. Around that time, the US started to move to, I guess I'll call them the century series numbers. Uh, with less overlap of M number in different categories of equipment. The M102 was a howitzer which entered service right around the time the M103 did. Also around that time you have the M104 SPG, the M106 motor carrier, M107, 108, 109 and 110 artillery pieces. They all came in around that time, as did the M113 APC, the M114 scout carrier. One may excuse the M60 as being a derivative in effect of the M48, and thus making it part of the earlier sequence. But the ARV variant of the M103 is the M51. So no, I can't give you an answer. Neither can Honeycutt or Estes in their books. They don't give me any hints on the matter either. Van Owen. On occasion, military equipment is painted up to be particularly visible to the enemy. The Red Baron's Flying Circus being a case in point. Did this ever happen to armor units or vehicles? Not really. The tiger faces on the Chinese Shermans in World War II and later found on Shermans and Pattons in Korea are the only obvious exceptions I can think of. For the Americans, they were trying to inspire fear, being dreamed up in the year of the metal tiger in the Chinese calendar. But by the time they all got painted and used, the lunar calendar had moved to the metal rabbit. Of course, as anyone knows, rabbits are not to be taken lightly, with a vicious streak a mile wide and being the most foul, cruel, and foul-tempered rodents he ever set eyes on. But still, they kind of missed the boat. I don't know what the excuse was for the Chinese tanks. Otherwise, the only example I can think of is the use of white light spotlights on tanks equipped with perfectly good night vision for peacekeeping operations. If you see someone trying to be sneaky and just turn to turret, they might not know that they've been spotted and may keep trying to do whatever dastardly destabilizing thing that they were planning on doing. If you turn to turret and turn on the spotlight though, you have made it very clear that their sneaking around has not worked. As an aside, if you are going to you know, spotlight somebody uh, who th you th they think they are sneaking up on you, let them low crawl out one or two hundred meters first and then light them up. Also, has there ever been a case of Shermans engaging Shermans? Yeah, probably. I wouldn't put it past one of the Egyptian-Israel clashes or India-Pakistan. It seems that Shermans were on both sides at the Battle of Chawinda, uh, but I cannot tell you if they engage each other because the vast majority of the tanks on both sides were M48s and Centurions. It probably was most common in World War II. The Germans were more than desperate enough to put captured tanks into service. If you check out the interview I did with Tom Sator elsewhere on my channel, you'll note that the only enemy tank he engaged was a Sherman. Josh Chase. I was watching the slow-mo guys on YouTube fire the 76mm and the shell came out with a bit of a wobble. Is this normal or the result of more or less an antique gun firing antique rounds? Actually, it's not an antique round. They actually cast inert projectiles and mate them to shell casings. Exactly how close your original tolerances these newer shell cases are and shells are, I can't tell you offhand. However, it is certainly true that many fin stabilized rounds require a couple of hundred meters to fully stabilize and gain the highest penetrative effect. Another oddity is, according to some archive document I ran into a while ago, and damned if I can't find it right now, a little yaw is actually desired for increased performance. I have absolutely no idea why this should be so, and the document did not explain. Again, if you have anything to sh any light to shed on this, comments below. I'll come back to it in the next Q&A. Andrew Wells. I do not like talking much about modern tank capabilities because there are no hard numbers, but there are any armed forces I think are there any armed forces I think might have a problem converting power on paper to military victories? Depends on who they're going up against, I guess. Egypt has a whole pile of M1 tanks built domestically, but from what I can gather, the quality control on the things isn't astounding. 
The ammo is doubtless not to American standards, and I have serious questions about the standard of training. Still, there's plenty enough of them to be an annoyance to any neighbours. I would wager even the Israelis would have to at least treat it with some respect. As, as I say, there are rather a lot of them. And I think that also applies to most nations. On an individual level, North Korea's equipment isn't particularly terrifying, but somehow I can't imagine that a second Korean war would be anything like a cakewalk. They'd almost certainly still lose, but it wouldn't be pleasant. Christian, what are the procedures in case of a misfire? Well, for the cannon on an M1, first you yell misfire. Then you crank the manual firing device, aka the master blaster, which is a small generator to send current to the firing pin. After that, you have a decision to make, depending on just how much of a nasty situation you are in, because the possibility is of a hang fire, which is basically a round which is sizzling and may at any moment decide to blow. This is not something that you want to go off with an open breach. It's probably a good idea to do nothing for a couple of minutes if you have a choice. If you don't have a choice, the next thing to do is reseat the round. So you grab your breech opening handle and you turn it about halfway. It'll drop the breech just a little bit. Probably not enough to make a difference if the round actually detonates at that point, but you know, better than nothing. Then let the breech slam up and close. If that doesn't work, well then you have to pull the round out hope that the case doesn't separate, rotate the round 180 degrees, slam it back in and try again, both electrical and master blaster. If it still doesn't work, the book says to restow the round in the rack, mark it and dispose of it at a later point. Rhys Genvi, can I shed some light on the development process of the ARL 44, giving the seemingly pre-production obsolescence? I don't have much to hand. There is a brief section in Histoire de Blandet Francais by Stéphane Ferrar. You need to go back to 1944, with France newly liberated but still at war with the Germans. The industry was in ruins, so both to make things to kill Germans with and also to help rebuild the economy, the new provisional French government started a domestic rearmament program. One of the issues concerned was coming up with a tiger killer, which it seemed the Allies were having trouble with as well. Enter the chief engineer of armaments, a bloke named Maurice Lavirot, who apparently started tackling the problem of building a French tiger killer whilst still under German occupation. He had been involved in the Char B1 program as well as a couple of others. The new liberated French government realized that what was truly needed was a brand new tank, but that also was well beyond the capabilities of France to obtain. As a result, a char de transition was required to tide France over until they could build something better, like AMX-50. 600 of these vehicles were ordered. The suspension came from the B1 Terror. The turret came from a Schneider Fortress tank designer in 1939. The engine proved a problem, solved only by the nicking of a German engine design during the occupation. The actual construction and testing of the turret mated to a brand new 90mm anti-aircraft gun caused problems and thus a delay in construction. Even the firing trials did not start until 1946, so the very B1-ish hulls were simply put into storage until the turrets could be built. Finally, enough of the things were built and installed to fuel the unit, which happened in 1949. So even using pre-war technology, the development timeline on this was still a long four years. Seeing a B1 derivative in 1949 might have been excusable, but as a tank for the 1950s, one can justifiably ask, hang on a second, what is this silliness? John P. The Welder. Okay, if you know what you do for a living. Are there talks of doing any more books with wargaming on mediums, lights, or artillery vehicles in the US? I ask because I have firepower and can openers. Well, thank you. Uh, probably not for me anytime soon. Part of the reason I picked the TDs was it seemed to be the subject with the highest ratio of stuff I found in the archives to stuff that had been published already. Tanks are already fairly well covered, and artillery may be an option because I've come across a fair bit of that, but I simply don't have the time for it. As for rebranding other books, such as other Honeycutt ones, there are no such negotiations at this time, but you can still buy them without the Wargaming covers or in-game goodies. 
Also, have I come across documents comparing tank armor steel from different factories in the US or from captured vehicles sent back to the US? Yes to both, uh, but I don't recall spending the time actually scanning them. They were in-depth metallurgical analysis of the composition and manufacturer technique, not just you know, test firing reports. I don't particularly understand them, not being a metallurgical engineer, and so in terms of priority, because I only have so many hours in the day when I'm at the archives, they were lower than other subjects. Other persons may have released such data, I don't think I have it on my hard drive. Tony Pardo, would the US have been better off adopting the CVRT over the M551? Not sure. Don't get me wrong, I think the CVRTs were fantastic recon vehicles, but I'm also not sure the T92 wouldn't have been about as good. So even if 551 wasn't to be used, T92 may have been picked instead, even if it couldn't swim. I'm also not sure the CVRT was designed with the airborne role in mind, you know, how airdroppable it is, and what its function will be in such a role. The Sheraton not only was to be a recon vehicle for grand units, but also to function as a sort of a fire support vehicle tank killer for airborne forces. If you're flying vehicles around, you want to have an all-in-one capability in one vehicle on one airplane, instead of sending a family of different vehicles like the recon vehicle, the fire support vehicle, and the anti-tank missile vehicle on three different airplanes. What holds the turret to the hull? Mainly gravity, frankly. I mean, face it, if you have something which has enough force to detach a 10 to 30 ton turret off the hull, one wonders if a couple of bolts will make much difference. However, and that is not to say that attachments are still not used. So, for example, you know the way when you make a model of a tank, the turret normally has to be angled a certain way so that the tabs fit into slots? Enter, apparently, the M3 Stewart, but I can't actually seem to find a photo of a Stewart's hull from above with a turret off. The M4 turret has a row of cap screws which attach the turret to the bearing race. I seem to recall 20 or 24 of the things. Uh, CTM 9-1750K. It's available online for the full turret removal instructions. Given that there are photos of Sherman's with the turrets popped off, it seems that 20 to 24 bolts were insufficient. There are also some forms of turret ring where the way the bearings kind of they're mounted horizontally almost, instead of you think that the weight of the, the hull is entirely on top of one, uh, the weight of the turret is entirely on top of the bearing and then bearing underneath so it rolls this way. In actuality, a lot of them, the bearings, I'll just put up a drawing, you'll see. Uh, but you'll see it also has a sort of a hold down effect that way as well. I'm just pausing so you can see the picture. Okay. Also, what does it mean for resources to be held at different army type levels? Well, basically, it is a combination of economy of force as well as a concentration of effort for specialty assets. So, for example, any brigade may be tasked with crossing a wide river, but it is not something which is routinely tasked, and neither is every brigade in the army going to be crossing a wide river at the same time. As a result, it is highly inefficient for every single brigade in the army to have a rapid deployable ribbon bridge in the inventory. Such things are kept at higher, you know, likely core, level. The core will decide which unit will conduct a crossing and then allocate to that unit the use of the bridging unit. When the bridge is complete and the brigade is on the far side, core gets its bridge unit back for use by some other brigade at some other location. J. What am I hoping will be under the tree for me this Christmas? Well, I'm recording this after the fact, obviously. I have received a lot of whiskey. On the downside, my 1978 Lionel locomotive has had its mighty sound of steam board fried. That was running under the tree. And I'm not quite sure what to do to help that. Suggestions are requested. I have a new computer on order. I seem to alternate between buying new and building my own. This time around, it's pre-built partially because I'm fed up with waiting until 2 a.m. because my relatively ancient Intel 2700K is uh, trying to finish rendering my YouTube video, and partially also because I want to play games with better fidelity. So Combat Mission, for example, is proving way too slow and jerky for me to play right now for starters, which is annoying since I just got the DLCs for Shock Force and Black Sea. So anyway, that got ordered around Christmas, and that should show up eventually. Alexander H. Is it true that World War II construction companies 
used Shermans to destroy houses. Well, more like demolition companies, but anyway, yes it is. And it wasn't just one either. There were a number of demolition companies using the things. Most tended to leave the tank fairly stock. I note that this one in the image is using the duck bills and track shields, which is questionable. Sometimes dozer blades will be fitted. The visibility out obviously is a little bit limited for construction work. So in one case in Oakland, they used an acetylene torch to simply cut out a hole in front of the driver and then covered said hole with wire mesh to keep the debris out. Okay, as far as it goes. Apparently, this Sherman was still in use in the 1990s for the job and was being used to demolish houses as a result of uh, the Loma Prieta earthquake in 89 or the Oakland fires in 91. I can't quite remember the story. One of the houses apparently had a basement which was not on the plans. Down went the tank and a beam went right through the wire mesh, just missing the driver's head. The guy got the message, hauled his tank out and immediately sold it. It ended up in the Littlefield collection complete with the hole, although I can't seem to find any photos of it offhand. I mean, frankly, the tank was in dire condition and probably wasn't worth the film. Hmm. Back in the days when we used film. This also is why tankers will look askew at the suggestion of driving through a building, regardless of how impressive or tactically surprising it may be. As face, any amusing stories or after action reports of Sherman Ops in the Pacific to share? I can't really think of any actually. I'm sure there are some, but no, none are coming to mind. And bear in mind, the two books I would look at for would probably be The Infantry's Army by Yaidi, uh, Infantry's Armor, or on the other side, Marine Tank Battles in the Pacific by Gilbert. Uh, so I have those two books and I can't think of one. How do vehicle crews manage to keep their optics and sensors clear in foul weather or muddy terrain? This is Time Bomb 757. Loader, get out and clean the optic. Usually there is a rag kept handy for such things. Now, if you're in a particularly snazzy vehicle, you may have a water squirting system and or a wiper, as you would find on your car. Thunderchild. Tanks will often have steel tracks or grousers for dealing with ice. How difficult of terrain is deep snow? By and large, as far as I know, not massively difficult. Yes, snow is basically water, and water is one of the most underestimated things when it comes to weight. So a whole lot of snow can be quite a weighty obstacle to deal with. But generally speaking, it's not going to stop a tank, at least as long as it tracks underneath of some level of grip. Josh Conti. Do I think that the US's amphibious LVTs and LVTAs were successful in the job they were designed to do in the Pacific compared to the European? I thought they were generally successful in both theaters, actually. Certainly lessons needed to be learned in the Pacific about things like putting armor on them or stern ramps like, and the like, uh, but that's just teething problems. Once that was sorted out, they were fine. The Europeans had less requirement to use them Though, obviously, they were of great benefit in the Netherlands, where water was a common problem. Nachtel Firakese would like me to observe upon any advantages or disadvantages to a reindeer-powered present supply vehicle, as opposed to one which uses tracks. This is going to involve some speculation, as it seems there is nothing on the matter in the archives. Either it remains classified, or the army hasn't gotten around to investigating this question. The Air Force may have, but I don't dig in their archives. Go ask uh, military aviation history. The obvious problem is that as a general rule, tracked vehicles are not designed to fly. And you will note that most tracked vehicle operators tend to have a definite preference for staying on the ground. The requirements for ground pressure tend not to work well with those of aerodynamics. The exact method of propulsion, how the drive is transferred to forward force, I don't know, but I will assume that if it works for hooves, it'll work for a track. The nice thing about a track system is it's pretty easy to verify proper operation. Tension can be checked, oil levels measured, and so on. A reindeer-powered system's running gear is far more difficult to access, requires specific equipment, and specially trained personnel. As a result, this seems to be a system only for specialty units, not widespread service. Another advantage to the track system is storage costs. When they're not in use, 
the costs are substantially lower. Just slap a coat of preservative on the system, lock it up, and when you open it up again in a year, as these operations seem to happen on a cyclical basis, then you have an excellent chance of the equipment starting up on demand. However, apparently, if you lock up a reindeer-powered system in a storage warehouse for a year, even with preservative applied, significant issues are to be encountered when attempting to commence operations for the following deployment. As a result, man hours and resources must be constantly applied whether the reindeer system is in use or not. Upgradability brings its own interesting set of problems, particularly with regard to drawbar pull. If one presumes that the planet's population continues to increase, it is not unreasonable to presume that the carrying capacity of the cargo bay may similarly also need increasing to meet increased requirements. For a tracked system, an increase in the ratios can be easily applied by the simple exchange of the final drives. However, to get the same result from reindeer will require partial amputation and possibly also installation of a replacement set of hooves, which is a fairly involved process overall with a higher than acceptable likelihood of failure to meet the QA requirements afterwards. One advantage to the reindeer system, however, is its modularity. Should individual modules fail to attrition, enemy action, mines or whatever, replacement is pretty much plug and play, assuming that the replacement chain has suitably prepared reindeer and stock in the supply system. This also means that in the event of greater capacity being required, additional modules may be added to the system. This, however, comes with its own drawbacks, such as increased maintenance costs, and comes with tactical liabilities, making a larger radar cross-section and target, and adding questions about the turning radius in tight areas. Also, standard procedure during the actual supply operation seems to be to land the entire system on the roof of the target house, already difficult enough with five rows of reindeer providing motive power. Uh, five if you're including the installation of the IFR all-weather module. Obviously, greater difficulties become apparent with a longer mode of powertrain. Overall, thus, like many other answers, it's horses for courses, or reindeer for courses. If one assumes that the operator is a specialty organization capable of meeting the specific resource-intensive needs of a hoof-powered running gear, then certainly it does seem to be feasible, as evidently appears to be the case by its use. TN Sheep, you and some tanker buddies have just started a band. What will you name it? Well, obviously it'll have to be a heavy metal band. Not my personal preference, mind. As for a name, uh, the Chieftains has already been taken. Since I am not known for my creative imagination, and this video is already running long, and I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm in part two now, I will leave it to the comments section below. Kazuki K. Does the low silhouette of later Eastern Bloc tanks, such as T-72, serve as a disadvantage in urban scenarios such as Grozny 1995? Yes. There are two problems. Firstly, elevation. Now, this isn't quite a problem unique to the Soviets, because Western tanks have elevation problems at close range as well, uh, just not quite as pronounced. The other side of the coin is gun depression. Apparently, a bunch of buildings in Grozny have basement windows, you know, basically little slits of glass at street level. The inability of the gun to depress because of the low height of the turret was found to be a significant problem to engage targets at close range, where, of course, they are the most dangerous. That said, that problem is also because they used the tank stupidly. When they went back for round two and were far more successful, they took into account the limitations of their armor and acted accordingly. Thus, the limitations were not, per se, a problem anymore. Why were T-62s and Lock-72s used in Afghanistan? Well, the T-62s would be good enough. The T-72s are more important things to be concerned about in Germany. Two. It is a question too. Does greater track width necessitate a greater output from the engine, or does the increased tractive capacity of the wider track balance this out? Yes, it does, and no, it doesn't. With wider track, you have likely more surface contact area in the hinges, because the hinges are wider, more metal scraping against metal as it curves around the idler and sprocket wheels. Also, there is an additional weight of metal that the engine needs to drag up and forward on a return run just because of the wider track. I've mentioned before that the move from 18-inch to 23-inch track added a full half ton per track that the engine needs to haul around. As a result, when the Americans built their 18-inch track tanks, it wasn't that they didn't understand the benefits of wider track, they just didn't think it was worth the penalties. A position that they changed later on in the war. 
Entry-level research. For a light armored force contesting a heavy armored force on the move, would field expedient means of damaging bridges, such as shooting at them with cannon or SP artillery, be a reasonable means of slowing pursuit? Not normally. Bridges, especially those designed to support heavy things the weight of tanks, tend to be very thoroughly built. Certainly a heat or HE round in the right spot could prove very effective, but you'd need to have a highly accurate, well-placed shot directed by someone who understands how to drop bridges. If you happen to have such a person along, like a combat engineer, the chances are that he brought demo charges of his own anyway. It's easier just to wire the thing. Supposedly Hesh rounds have a particular benefit in the demolition role, but I don't know how much better in practical terms it would be, or if it would still beat some engineers with a jeep filled with demo. Rad W. What is my opinion on tanks where the commander's position is center line in the turret? Well, the big issue with it is that it's not, I don't think, space efficient. Yeah, I get that it gives more room to the gunner. But in order to have room for the cannon to recoil and the loader to do his job, the TC needs to be placed way to the rear in a massive turret or else way up high in a tall turret, both of which also add weight and vulnerability. This is before the psychological effect of having the gun recoiling right at you, which I presume one gets over after a while. At least I don't recall hearing many such complaints from Panzer IV commanders. There's probably a reason why such a placement is not found anymore. The M60A2 was an interesting detour because the small nature of the cannon, which didn't require all that much space and allowed for the narrow profile. I wouldn't be too concerned about the ability for the TC to observe the fine details of what's going on at a turret. You're supposed to be able to trust your crew. But when you do go down to a three-man crew, I do like the ability to manipulate the gunner's control panel from the commander's seat. It's not a possibility with an isolated TC's position. Yes, I get that the centerline TC seat means everyone likely gets a hatch, uh, but that's not a good enough reason to make the turret that much bigger. I submit that such things should only be done when other design features, such as a massive cannon, require it. Charles Charange. What's the most surprising vehicle I've explored? I.e. I went in with preconceived notions one way and then found them totally untrue. I have to give props to the T-72. Supposedly designed solely for incredibly short people, I fit fine in the thing. It's confining and claustrophobic because you don't have much room around you, but if you think about it, it's not as if I need to take up uh, leg space to allow room for a second crewman on the same side of the turret. My legs fit fine unlike in a large number of tanks. Similarly, I found Leopard, both 1 and 2, to be a little bit less roomy inside than I was expecting. Not disastrously so, mind. Otherwise, I don't think I encountered anything particularly astonishing. I have certainly been surprised by things, but not necessarily because I had preconceived notions. I often just had absolutely no idea what to expect, such as with the Swedish vehicles. USA, USA, are the books behind me the only ones I have? No, but they are the vast majority of the armor-related ones. So I've got a full shelf up there, full shelf down there, pretty much a full shelf down here. I do have a shelf of floaty things on the far side, with also a few more tanks and zoomies. Uh, I also, although I'm not a huge fan of it, have some of my library on digits. I like being able to flick through a book, but on occasion for availability or sometimes speed, I have to get the electronic copies. I sometimes remark to myself how surprising it is that I have a fairly thorough library which covers most topics I encounter, whilst only taking up really three big shelves. Matthew Lessig. During the first Gulf War, 30 years old at this month, why are the coalition armies so effective at killing Warsaw Pact equipment? Well, by and large, it came down to the Allies, mainly US, bringing along the very best that they had. Units were still being re-equipped with M1A1s just before the off, and the Iraqis were equipped with you know, equipment which is a half generation older at the very best. The ammunition they used was relegated to basically training status in the Soviet army. If you think about it, an M1A1 of the time cost somewhere north of two million dollars. If a brand new, fresh from the production line, $2 million tank couldn't wipe the floor with a decade old, half million dollar tank, we would be asking questions over where our tax dollars were going. That said, training also has something to do with it as well. The Allies generally consisted of volunteer, well trained forces. The Iraqis, 
not so much. So you have well-trained forces with better equipment and total air superiority going up against conscripts mainly. The result should not be surprising. Hugo Yu. Western designations in literature, not NATO designations, are often not correct compared to the actual Soviet designation, yet we see widespread use. And the example that he gave was the PT-76B being written as the model 1959 with the D-56TM, whilst in reality, PT-76B was from 1962 with the T-56TS. Well, my opinion is if they're, they're wrong, they're wrong and should be stamped out. The real question is, well, how do you know that they're wrong if you're reading it in the literature? Now, that said, I will still use NATO reporting names over Russian official names in most cases, unless there is a specific reason to go Russian. The NATO names are selected for a logical reason and to create easy common understanding. As long as that common understanding purpose is achieved, mission accomplished. Of course, the reason that the literature is often wrong in the first place is that the Russians did not issue press releases with the new equipment, so folks started coming up with their best efforts. Even when the Russians did start issuing press releases, it was normally in Russian, which wasn't any more helpful to most people who would keep referring to the English language literature that they could understand. Centurion 4007. In replacing the Bradley, would the US do better to have different vehicles for the IFV and CFV roles? Would the advantages of more specialist vehicles outweigh the flexibility of a common variant? The British are moving to a multi-role platform, but with the greater US budget, running two vehicles might be more reasonable. My thoughts? Well, if money were no object, sure. I mentioned in the Q&A 16 that the US Army's cavalry has a different role to that of most armies. There is a much greater emphasis on combat ability, which of course is a bit counter to the idea of a recon vehicle being small and sneaky. Remember that prior to Bradley, the US Army was moving in the direction of two separate vehicles and then just combined the one program. Now, this turned out not to be all bad. The move to the Bradley meant that you couldn't tell if you were looking at a line infantry unit or just a scout if you saw it. And the large size meant that the cavalry vehicle carried quite a bit of ammunition and supplies for the combat role. This all said, I'm not actually quite sure how different an IFV would be in practice to a heavy combat capable recon vehicle. I can see a difference in the gun maybe, losing some space perhaps for sensors and ammo where the infantry might go, but I don't see why it can't realistically be performed by the same basic whole platform, at least to 95% effectiveness and 60% of the cost. That money saved can go into other assets which more than make up for that missing 5%. Jenny R. What do I think would have happened had TD force persisted post-war? With tripod and vehicle-mounted recoilless rifles starting to show up, do I think it could have found a return to form with massed, light, inexpensive anti-tank vehicles as originally envisioned, instead of the quasi-tanks it ended up with during the war? I am reminded a bit of the Grenadier Tank Destroyer Battalion with killer cars, basically jeeps carrying blokes with anti-tank rifle grenades. For the post-war environment though, remember that the TDs weren't disbanded because they didn't work, they were disbanded because they were inefficient. The results of World War II showed, to no huge surprise, that purpose-designed anti-tank vehicles with purpose-trained crews did better than general purpose tanks with general purpose crews at killing enemy armor. But for the cost of the battalion of men and vehicles, again, you could take the good enough tank unit and just buy a second tank unit. Then, as time progressed, exactly what you observed happened. The mobile anti-tank vehicles, first recordless rifles, then missiles, started to be fielded. So in theory, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if an entire battalion of such light missile vehicles would have been fielded had TD branch hung around long enough. But the problem is that we're talking about a counterfactual, which even in its counterfactual state, still has the same fundamental problem, which caused the reality in the first place. Not until you get to a capability so dramatically different from ground vehicles, the attack helicopter battalion, does the tank destroyer concept as the branch understood it really come back into being. Matthew Lesich, what is the blue jacketed round of ammo I have displayed on my shelf and is there a story behind it? And that's this, and people, I've had people threaten to call CID on me for stealing 30mm Apache ammo. 
I bought this in Bovington and it is apparently a, I, I will say fired because it's, uh, uh, the ring has the rifling marks on it. Um, a 30 millimeter dummy round off of an Aiden. Uh, I presume an aircraft. Actually, it's got writing on the bottom of it. CY90 Prac 4Z. Practice, okay. Practice, obviously, is, I have no idea what CY90 is. 1544 30 millimeter RG89. If that means anything to anybody, that's what it is. So that was back in the days when Barbington used to sell ammunition. I got like, uh, I think this round here, I think is a, uh, a tracer round for a wombat. Uh, no, not the Australian animal. It's a uh, weapon of magnesium battalion anti-tank. It was a British anti-tank rifle. Well, coilless. I also picked up, they did a brilliant chieftain t-shirt and it was like a lightning storm and you can just make out the silhouette of the chieftain behind the lightning and they don't sell it anymore. Very disappointing. Anyway, that's what around it. There's no particular story. I picked it up in Bovington in the 90s and I've been traveling around with it ever since. Devon Nasrini, we were watching Patton and heard the lie near the start that the German tanks were all diesel. What fuel do German tanks and other vehicles use? Well, yes, the famous error, as you correctly observe, the fuel of choice for all German military vehicles was petrol. A few rear echelon soft skins may have used wood. Not in the sense of steam locomotives, but wood gas. So you're basically cracking the wood under high heat to create a fuel. The system is extremely heavy, bulky, and inefficient, but it does work, especially when the alternative is no petrol and thus no movement. Are there any other tank related things in the movie which were wrong, other than M48s playing Panzers? I couldn't tell you offhand. I have the DVD, but I haven't had the time to watch it in years, and my memory on that fails me. And right, that will do it. I hope you found the video interesting and informative. I'm going to be taking a couple of weeks break now due to military obligations, and I will be back in mid-February. Take care.